So good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Cover Crop Innovators webinar. Today we're joined with the Cover Crop coach, Steve Groff, who's going to be sharing with us some options for planting cover crops after wheat, which uh, as I've seen the crop progress reports rolling in this week uh, is a very timely topic and uh, there's lots of good opportunities to uh, plant cover crops in the middle of the summer here if you're not double cropping. So thank you, Steve, for joining us this morning. Uh, why don't you go ahead and take it away from here? Well, thank you very much, uh, Conrad. And again, I, I appreciate this opportunity to share. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, com uh, cover crop options for planting after wheat harvest, where right now we're kind of almost in the middle of that in the, in the, from the perspective of the country. And uh, it certainly is a golden opportunity, I like to say, to be able to uh, plant cover crops. And I've just put this uh, couple slides up here to show you that cover crops can really do a lot for our soil if we get them planted in a timely fashion. And this is what it's all about, to try to plant cover crops in the middle of summer uh, when we have this opportunity of a long growing period so we can accomplish a lot. And uh, this is just a picture of some radishes. They weren't planted directly after wheat in my farm here, August the 10th. Uh, but you can see how they rooted down in the middle picture there. You can see how they float, uh, followed an earthworm channel, which is so cool when you're able to see that in the context of a soil pit. And then at the very right-hand side there, that is a root hair that we found six feet, two inches deep. Now, uh, any of you have worked with soil pits, you don't just find these things instantly. Uh, we had to use spray bottles and with water to be able to find these little root hairs. But uh, indeed, that came from a, a radish that was planted. Um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't that many weeks before, but uh, with the help of time, and good fertility and so forth, you can see what, uh, what, what occurred. Now, I'll just use this picture to point out back over to the left-hand side there, you see those radish tubers. And those radish tubers are, are collecting nutrients that those tap roots pulled up. And that's part of, of course, why we use cover crops. But uh, just to be able to see that and identify that is helpful. Uh, the other thing that it flies in the face of a lot of farmers saying they just don't have time to plant cover crops or there's no available planting window. And of course, the question that we all ask is, do they pay? Well, I'm here to say that when you plant cover crops after wheat, we have plenty of time. Um, that's a wide planting window that we have, wide options. I mean, it, it not every day counts quite like I preach when you're doing after corn or soybeans. Uh, but still, we want to get them planted as soon as possible, and it's hard not to see some economic payback when we plant them this early. So I like to say that there's uh, there's really no excuses if you're plant if you can plant cover crops after wheat. Whenever I'm driving around in August and I see a wheat field that have been harvested weeks before, I'm like, what are they thinking? I mean, it's just like the prime time, you know, to be able to plant. So uh, so yeah, no excuses uh, for sure. Well, when we start thinking about, hey, I want to plant a cover crop, well, let's go through a little checklist here. And what do I plant and how do I plant it and so forth? Well, part of making those decisions come with fertility. And, and that comes in, in different forms. Uh, number one, if manure is or was applied or the fields have high fertility, then you will want to use a cover crop or a cover crop mix that scavenges nitrogen. And that's oats and radish, annual ryegrass, sorghum sedan grass, millet. Um, you can just go down the list there because we're planting in the summer, so our options are really, really broad. Uh, I will say that typically after wheat, there's not a lot of nitrogen left over. So just keep that in mind. So pretty much here, it would be in the context of manure that we want to lend our cover crops a little bit more toward the grasses that can soak up nitrogen. 
So uh, number two, typically if there is no nitrogen or very little, then we want to lean on legumes or a, or a mix that has uh, legumes in it. And some of the legumes we're going to talk about today are sun hemp, cow peas, crimson clover, hairy vetch. You could add Austrian winter peas. You could add uh, a whole list of other ones there too. And then finally, when we're, when we're looking at our, um, our checklist of, of how to decide the species, what is the intended crop next year? So if we're going to a, like soybeans, then we'd probably want to stay more to the grasses. Uh, if they're gone to corn, maybe more to the legumes, just to actually make more nitrogen for that crop. So this is just some simple things to think about based on the fertility that's in the field, on the field, and the needs of the next crop coming up. So there's plenty of time to make this all work. And uh, so we have lots of options. But there's still some other decisions that we need to make. And one of them that I kind of face almost every year, not sure knowing what to do, and that is the timing of when we plant. Now, obviously, I'd like to plant like right away, right as, as soon as possible to take advantage of everything. But there is a couple challenges that can come up while doing that. Um, so we have two choices basically, wait a couple weeks and then, and then spray, and that would be existing weeds, or more importantly, cleaning up volunteer wheat. Um, and if we have really good wheat and it's uh, high quality, a lot of times there's very, very little that's left in the field or left behind the combine that comes out the combine, very little. Uh, if, there's, if you have a, a time where the wheat is not good quality and there's some shriveled up kernels, there's, there's more blowing out the back of the combine, even though those kernels are poor quality, they do sometimes germinate and grow. So if you're like me uh, and you uh, bale the straw after uh, you combine, those kernels will be focused in a small area, you know, four to five feet wide maybe. And that can create problems with our cover crop, depending how much is there. So there's, there's something that needs to be considered. And obviously, if the ground is very dry, no rain in sight, there probably won't be any volunteer wheat growing until you get some, a decent rain. And then we can, you can tell if there's any under, weeds that were in the understory of the wheat or not. That can dictate when you spray. If you want to wait to leave those weeds, just kind of come back to life a little bit so that you can kill them. So that's going to have to be a decision that's made based on observation and, and what your goals are and so forth. But of course, you can plant the cover crop immediately, which takes advantage of the time you have. But I will say volunteer wheat can cause problems. And I've seen uh, where you can see the windrows, where the windrows was are actually right behind the combine uh, later on. And, the, and, it, and because the wheat is already there, it gets sometimes it can get a head start and cause problems for the cover crop, making the sequential uh, cash crop, it, it's, uh, you know, may take more nitrogen out of that area or something. So it kind of screws up the fertility that you want to have involved with your cover crop. So um, ideally, I guess you could say uh, you, 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 of course, plant immediately, but then you have to consider some of these situations that arise and decide uh, what to do. Um, for me, myself, I kind of evaluate how good a wheat crop is. Right now, our wheat crop's looking very good. I'm hoping to plant right behind the combine. So uh, that's just some of the things that I do. I want to talk a little bit about establishing a cover crop and the opportunity we have here of using precision planters. A lot of farmers have uh, a, a bigger planters. Now, the fact that you have wheat probably means you have a drill and can easily plant your cover crop. That being said, some farmers have larger equipment, uh, particularly if you have 15-inch type precision planters that you might use for soybeans, where you can plant the crop quicker. And one thing nice about using precision planters is that because we're planting earlier in the year, the cover crop has plenty of time to grow and fill in the 15-inch spacing. 
Whereas if you have a, um, a drill, you want to use that when you're getting into later September and October because of the narrower spacing so you can get the plant canopy a little bit better. So using a precision planter after wheat is a, certainly a valid option if you happen to have it. You can reduce your seeding rates because of good optimal um, uh, seed placement, seed to soil contact, and so forth. Then again, if you have a 30-inch planter, uh, it, it becomes a little questionable if you want to plant cover crops in 30-inch rows. I've seen it being done before, like for, for radishes, where there's, the idea was just to uh, try to to just to use those radishes to soak up nitrogen. And they can probably do that in 30 inch rows if that's the only uh, thing you're trying to accomplish. So it's just something to mention out there. And I, I do mention this because this precision planning is increasing definitely because of the wide planters that we have available to us. So um, that upper, upper uh, left hand picture there is actually radishes and peas in Wisconsin. And in that case, it was a 30-inch planter that the way he did is he split the planter and planted peas, put peas on one side and radishes on the other side and drove up and then came back and, and split the middles in order to get the every other row effect on 15-inch centers. So that's just one way you can at least try it. That might get old if you have a lot of acres to do, but uh, that being said, just wanted to give you some ideas of what some people have done. And also, when we have uh, precision planters, a lot of them are vacuum, but if you happen to have a Kinsey brush meter, which does not use air, either pressure or vacuum, there is, um, there is an option there where by using your soybean plates or even your Milo plates, you, or you get Milo plates, where you can plant cover crop mixes. You can also plant single species in there as well, like Milo disc for radish and Austrian winter peas using a soybean disc. But you can use that soybean disc, disc for um, higher rate mixes uh, that may include something like small grains or oats or something like that. And then you can use the Milo plates to, to use smaller mixes that may include crimson clover, radish, even annual ryegrass. But to do that, the way these plates are designed, there's some holes in them to allow debris to flow through and for the regular use. But there's these backing plates you can get to bolt on and uh, that'll keep the, all your, most of your uh, cover crop mix in place. So if you happen to have a brush meter, they're very easy to use uh, mixes on. And I put a phone number in there, uh, Perido is the name of a company now. Uh, some of you may have heard of Larry Hack, a farmer who invented this. He's now licensed this to another company that actually makes these plates. They also have plates available now for vacuum planters, uh, for the Kinsey uh, Edgevac, I believe it is, and for John Deere planters. I know they're still t testing precision planting uh, plates to, to be able to plant cover crops with. So, if you have any planter like that, it might be something you want to check into. At least it's an option out there to do this. And the, the appealing thing about using precision, precision planters is you, you, reduce, you, you can reduce your seeding rates and you can do a really good job. So just something to consider that if, um, if, that's, if that's something you happen to have in your shop. Okay, is there any... Um, uh, questions maybe with the planters and so forth. I want to I want to talk about uh, different species and so forth. But if there's any questions, if you just want to unmute yourself and ask them, I'll just pause for a little bit and um, and maybe you can ask your question. One thing I'll I jump see, in uh, here. Charles, oh. okay. I'll just jump in here real quick, Steve, and, and it, you should be able to unmute your mic if you want to ask a question live. Um, I, I uh, did look up the website here for, for Peridot and uh, put that in the comments. So if you guys do want to find those backing plates, uh, you can follow that link. Yep, good idea. Uh, Charles, do you have a question? I see you're on. Uh, we can't hear you, so <laughs> maybe you can keep trying or something. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, see, you're not. Okay. 
Um, I'm just going to move on. Uh, again, any questions you might have, uh, please don't hesitate. Some of the cover crops that we can plant after wheat, and believe me, there's many because of the, the options we have there. But some of the more popular ones, I want to tell you the ones that we have been using and recommending, and that sun hemp. Uh, I'm going to talk more about sun hemp here in a second, uh, but uh, sorghum sudan grass, millet, radish, buckwheat, long-standing long cover crop for the summer, cowpeas, oats, and, and uh, many more. But I want to spend a little bit of time on sun hemp because it's kind of like the go-to cover crop after wheat. That's the perfect time to plant it. So um, we have the uh, summer planting window. It fits right there with what we're doing. It grows really fast, put on some nitrogen quickly. And uh, some of the neat things that it does is it helps to suppress nematodes. Now, when we get specific about nematodes, that's kind of a whole other league there. So that's why we just say suppresses nematodes. It, it can be a wide range there, but that's been noted numerous times. And it, it grows fast enough that it can suppress weeds, but you're going to have to feed at least 30 pounds per acre if you're going to uh, suppress uh, weeds. Normally, you'll plant at 15 to 20 pounds per acre by itself if you're just going after some nitrogen production and just have the cover crop in there. But uh, um, you've got to up that rate if you want to plant uh, to try to get uh, this is a weed suppression. I just have a few pictures here. I also just want to mention that it is suited for poor soils. It seems to grow quite well. Uh, doesn't mind hot weather. And even when it's dry, it does pretty good. And, uh, the pictures you see there were 26 days after planting there on the left, and it's uh, over a foot tall already. And then on the right, you can see some of the nodulation there where it's already starting to make nitrogen. So just to show you how quickly this plant is able to thrive and, and be helpful to your soils. Some of the things you do need to be careful about, and one of them is once they start flowering, they kind of turn into their namesake, which has the word hemp in it. And we all know that hemp can make ropes. Well, we don't want to make ropes. And believe me, and I've, I've seen this happen already, you can start getting these stems next spring to wrap around your closing wheels and so forth. And I've heard, I've heard it said that there's people who had bearings burn out because of it. So when you start seeing a couple flowers, it's time to think about terminating it. Unless there's a killing frost on the, on the horizon, because uh, when you have a killing frost, and I mean when it's all white everywhere, um, I'll just say 30 degrees more or less, you want this plant, this, it'll kill this plant. But you want to make sure this is dead. Sometimes people will roll it. Sometimes you, you can spray it out with, uh, with glyphosate or touch a 2,4-D. This is just the kind of the warning label, I should say, that comes with this. And I don't want to use to say this to discourage uh, planting it. I just say it's something you need to understand and be aware of when you're using SunNet. So, but I, I like to mix up species, cover crop mixes, and there's good reasons to do that. A really good one here after wheat, and this would be, I will say, one of the more popular ones, um, one of my favorite, and one that I'll be planting here shortly. It's sorghum sudan grass, sun hemp, and radish. Now, everything I said about sun hemp can be applied to sorghum sudan grass, except sorghum sudan is not a legume. Sorghum sudan grows really fast. And I could argue it even grows faster than uh, sun hemp. But when you put them two together, the sun hemp provides nitrogen for the sorghum sudan to grow. And so they're a really good partner and a good companion. The reason we add radish here is because both sorghum sudan and sun hemp, they kill at the first hard freeze. Now just look at this picture closely. This was taken soon after a hard freeze. Over the left side, you can see some sun hemp that's getting into flower. And it's good it was killed because it's starting to get a little ropey by this time. But notice the radishes, how vibrant and green they are. And the radishes thrive in the cooler temperatures. And because of the increased sunlight coming down through now, um, it, it will uh, help those radishes to kind of revive and start to grow and actually take up some of the nitrogen 
that the sun hemp provided early on. So uh, I really, I, I really like this, and I like to say it's the one-two punch, where you have the sorghum Sudan sun hemp. They grow, they dominate. The radishes look pretty lethargic there in September, but once the frost kills sorghum Sudan sun hemp, the radishes uh, they'll grow up to eight weeks, up to eight weeks longer. Um, I see Cody has a question here, will sun hemp regrow if it's mowed? And the answer is yes, but it's before bud stage or around bud stage or earlier, and it can't be mowed too low to the ground. If, it's, if you keep the mower up maybe three to four inches at least, it, it will regrow. Now, just to follow up with that, sorghum sedan will absolutely regrow if you cut it even up past boot stage. I've seen seed heads come out. And you're going to see some pictures here soon uh, where even the seed heads are coming out and it's cut pretty low to the ground and it will regrow. So this is, uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, the forage options uh, using this later on, but I thought I'd answer that, that question up front here. Um, some of the things we need to pay attention to is plant it up until two months before the average first killing frost. So just think about what is the first killing frost in your area. My area, it's about October the 20th. So you go back two months, that would be August the 20th. So I'm going to plant this before August the 20th. After that, it's probably, we'll just stick with radishes or do something else and not use sorghum sedan or sun hemp. So about two months before the average First killing frost is kind of the cutoff date to plant these summer annuals. And here's a suggested seeding rate here, 10 pounds of sun hemp, 7 pounds of sorghum sedan, 3 pounds of radish to the acre. Uh, that's a suggestion. That's pretty baseline. Uh, that's as a cover crop. Uh, it, it'll produce a lot of biomass, biomass and give you some weed suppression. But if you're really, really looking for weed suppression, you need to up those rates. If that is a primary goal, uh, more like 20 pounds of sun hemp and 15 pounds of sorghum sedan, but keep the radish at about three pounds. So it's nice to have these three distinct species and the great um, biodiversity that it brings. It uh, just seems to be a, a good combination. Again, you can substitute cow peas in there, uh, mung beans. I didn't mention that before. They're another one that's good in the legume. And there's all kinds of grasses and millets that can be used as well instead of sorghum sedan. Uh, pearl millet is is one that's close to sorghum sedan that might be one of one of my favorites as well in this case. Um, any questions on um, on the sorghum sedan or sun hemp that anybody would have? One uh, one comment I would just throw in here, Steve, if I may. This is Conrad. Um, I found that when planting early in the summer. Uh, like let's say in the month of June, there seems to be a case for just doing a warm season mix without that cool season component, just because if you have pearl millet or sorghum sudan grass in there, those grasses and that sun hem can be so competitive, it can almost choke the radish out. But once we're yeah. into July and certainly August, that's when uh, you know I wholeheartedly agree in putting the two or three pounds of radish in there, because while the warm season species will still get five or six feet tall potentially, that radish is still going to have room to establish itself mm -hmm. in July and yeah. August. Yeah. No, I, I do agree to that. Um, and point, point well taken. Yep. Well, let's move on to another uh, combination here. And this would probably work better. Let's just say for whatever reason, you don't get anything planted in your wheat field and you wait a month or whatever, let the volunteer wheat grow, you might want to consider radish and oats. That's another popular combination, and you can see some of the pictures I have listed there. Typically, these will winter kill everywhere below, below I-70, um, typically, I say. Uh, it does depend on how mature they are. The, the more mature they are in the fall, the easier they are to winter kill. So just something to keep in mind there in, in that. Um, but I have this uh, listed out here. This, this is where you want to be able to plant 
like three weeks before the first average killing frost up until then. So as I used my example before, October the 20th is my first killing frost. And if I back up, that means almost till, the, well, the end of uh, September I can plant this. So this is, where, this is where that kicks in. This is where the radish and oats fit. And again, uh, real high biomass production. And if you are going after weed suppression, I have listed there 41 pounds of oats and, and four pounds of radish to the acre. That just makes it nice, 45 pounds uh, per acre to set your drill. Great for first timers. It's one of those uh, combinations that's hard to screw up because it, it winter kills most, area, most areas and it's fairly easy to plant into in the spring. If you're um, not really concerned about weed control, you can pretty much cut the oat rate in half, but that four pounds of radish there, three or four pounds of radish seems to work very well in that situation. One of the other aspects in using cover crops that are planted earlier on is the golden opportunity for forage and or grazing. And uh, if you happen to have cattle, this is definitely a no-brainer. Uh, you want to put your cattle out on that because there's plenty of time that they can go out there and get their own forage and um, it's, just, it's just a beautiful way to be able to take advantage of an opportunity of a growing season by using cover crops. So uh, a few words of caution here. Uh, radishes by themselves do not make ideal hay or silage because they're very low in fiber and very high in moisture. And anyone that's really in the cattle business would probably know that, but I just thought I'd mention it there. And also, when you use radishes in a mix, Generally, you don't go more than two to three uh, pounds per acre. Sometimes with oats, you can get away with four pounds, as I alluded to. But uh, you want to keep the radishes on that lower side, two to three pounds per acre. So it's just kind of a FYI there in using radishes. But when you're going after grazing or as forage, um, depending on the, the mix you have, you want to ensure there's adequate fertility, specifically nitrogen. So if you don't have the option to have some legumes in your mix, you're, you might want to consider adding some nitrogen to that so you can get that, to, again, to maximize that growth potential. That's going to vary from farm to farm, so each farm would need to kind of determine what that is. And as I alluded to earlier, if forage is a primary uh, aspect that you're trying to accomplish, you need to increase your seeding rate. And usually that's around double the cover crop seeding rate. So just as a rule of thumb there, if you're comfortable with knowing what your seeding rates are for cover cropping, forage is generally double that. Um, now, in the context of a mix, um, specifically radishes are kind of like a, an anomaly. You just never want to get above two to three pounds in a forage situation uh, using radishes. Now I want to uh, shift gears a little bit here and share why I have been getting away from planting double crop soybeans after wheat, which is typical in my area. And I've done several researches uh, over the years uh, in, in actually taking corn yields following cover crop, different cover crop plots and noticing how my corn yielded. And and if you if you look across here in this graph, this chart, the control in this case did not have a cover crop. That's the bar over there on the left, the maroon colored bar. The dark blue was the combination of all the cover crops that you see on the right. So you can just show the effect of cover crops. Now I have uh, five different nitrogen rates that we applied and I didn't want to confuse you by showing them all, but they, they, they are fairly parallel and all the, all the way down to zero nitrogen to 200 pounds per acre was applied to the corn crop. So if you look across the bottom there, I, I kind of tongue in cheek have said greedy beans. Uh, that is the term I'm using here for double crop soybeans. Uh, 163 bushel per acre was my corn yield. Now again, I'm going to remind you, this is a combination of all my fertility treatments from zero to 200. So my uh, yields were higher on the higher rates of nitrogen, but I wanted to show you the trend line here. 
When we added triticale, the next one over to the right, you can see we lost a little nitrogen, excuse me, we lost a little yield. And had I treated that plot as an individual, I probably would have added more nitrogen, at, especially at the lower rates. It really suffered because the triticale took it up and didn't really give it back. Uh, the next one is uh, the, the name of one of the old mixes I was involved with. It is that sorghum sedan, sun hemp, and radish, uh, the homestead one. Again, you can see we got a yield bump. But look at what the straight radish did. It actually uh, gave us a 19 um, bushel per acre yield increase. And I've seen this many, many, many times. There's just something about what radish is due to the soil. And then uh, the tillage sun is actually sun hemp. That gave us a nice boost. So I put this slide up here showing you, I've seen this uh, multiple years, and it's a good representation there. And it's one of the reasons why I feel that I can do a better job overall if I plant a cover crop or, or a mix of cover crops in my overall soil health building for long-term soil health, uh, stuff like that. So, um, you know, that's just some of the things that I have seen. And um, so, anyway, that's one of the reasons I'm going to talk here about, and I'm wrapping up here, about uh, using cover crops instead of double crops after wheat. But the question is, what about the straw? We all know that the straw does have nutrients in it, and if we uh, bail it off, they're gone, and they're off the field. Now, the only exception would be if you're using the straw yourself as animal bedding, it might come back in the field as manure. Uh, that being said, some uh, uh, take the straw and, and run it through the chopper and, and goes right back out the combine, right back on the land. And that's probably the way most of the straw is handled. Uh, in my area, uh, we have a pretty good market for straw. So uh, we sell it out of the field, like right now, it's, it's our price is a little bit off because we're having a pretty good year, but it's probably going to be $110, $120 a ton for straw. So I do bail my straw. Uh, some people wonder why I do that in the context of everything else I do, but I am planting a cover crop immediately after it. So I want to take you through a quick series of slides here where uh, this is actually last year. I'm doing some tests, and then you'll see these plots. We took this, the wheat off, and we're planting here, double crop soybeans, and we're also planting a, a good cover crop that's going to be used as a cover as a cover crop for forage. And so here you can see the plots are replicated, and um, the wheel will take measurements and so forth. And as the summer progressed, you can see the sorghum sedan sun hemp is growing taller than the double crop soybeans there, which is indeed what you would expect. And um, oh, it just it's just a beautiful thing to be able to to see these cover crops grow because I know what they're doing for my soil. And when you just look close and, and are able to see the nodulation on the sun hemp, like you see here, uh, for me, it's just what, it's what's exciting. It's, but it's what's exciting about what I do and what we do with cover crops is to see that occur and to know that I don't have to buy as much nitrogen to be able to uh, grow a decent crop. But look at this here, how, how this grew. Um, again, this was a nice... Uh, a nice seeding right here. I could have planted a little thicker potentially, but it worked out good. So um, I decided to go in and cut this. And this is only 52 days after planting. So just a, you know, just you know, literally just over seven weeks planting. That stuff was like almost six feet tall. And so we went in and uh, raked it up and uh, got it bailed, and I sold it to a neighbor. And I was very impressed by uh, what I got off of that. But not only that, what happened then in the next two months is I went back in and I planted uh, some uh, other cover crops like hairy vetch and crimson clover, but that sort of sedan regrew. So that's the same field I just showed you. And the sorghum sedan regrew. So this is the end of October. We've had a killing frost, as you can see. But um, I'm not sure what or uh, how much I get out of that. But when you look at the numbers here, I did take off 2.5 tons of dry matter per acre. And if you compare that to an average around here of 35 bushels of uh, double crop beans, 
I'm even making a little bit more money doing it this way. Now I know these numbers can shift around, depends on markets and so forth, but at least it gives you an idea. The thing though that I think tips the scales for me, after double crop beans, we don't get them off to like Thanksgiving, the third week or so of November, and it's very little time to plant a cover crop. But over here on the left, I, you, you saw that regrowth that I had growing there. And we have another, we have a great cover crop going into the following year. And just look at this here. This is, uh, again, this is like eight weeks after plant, after cutting um, that first time, that nice regrowth. I got some lupins down in there and some uh, sunflowers actually I replanted and a couple different things, hairy vets and so forth. And so it's just, to me, it's very exciting to be able to manage it this way since I have the opportunity to market the forage is what, uh, is what helps me in that. So just to take this one step further, this year instead of planting the second time, I intend to at least try some of my acres to put this mix out that you see. And I'm thinking that, of course, the circumstance sun hemp is going to like dominate. I'm hoping the radish, hairy vetch, triticale, and crimson clover will survive. And then after we cut, for one cutting of forage, then those bottom four species there will come to life and go into the winter. So as you can see here, not only am I getting forage, I'm still getting a fantastic cover crop out of this. Um, just wrapping up here, and then we're going to open it up for some questions if anybody has it. Um, one of the things that you need to be aware of is if we're going to be planting things like a hairy vetch or a crimson clover, um, earlier, and we're used to seeing that how that functions when we plant it, like in September. If you plant in August or even July, and those type of cover crops grow more than 12 inches, they may winter kill, whereas traditionally they would not. So if you have a hairy vetch that grows a foot or more because you planted it early, it may winter kill. So I just want to put that word of uh, understanding out there so you can you can uh, you know, expect what the possibilities may be. Now it's going to give you some nitrogen for your succeeding cash crop, but it, it may uh, winter kill. So um, here I have listed here a few more annual ryegrass as well. It can grow early and then be, it kind of smothers itself and that's why it winter kills. Even triticale or cereal rye, particularly if it has a lot of nutrition there, it may grow two feet tall if planted early, and, and it can, it, it, I have seen the winter take that out, whereas planted later, it'll come through just fine. One question here, Steve, that came in uh, on that mix you just shared with, uh, let's see here, 20 pounds of warm season species plus, um, you know, about 35 pounds of cool season species. Do you have any plans to, to fertilize that? I mean, you're, you're coming right off of, of wheat. There's not going to be much nitrogen there. Would you stand to mm -hmm. benefit to put a little nitrogen on that? Uh, in my fields, no. Uh, and I've, I've, at least that's what I'm thinking now. This is going to be a test here. I put it back up on the screen there. Uh, I feel that the sun hemp is going to pretty much provide what needs to be for the sorghum sedan. Those are the two kingpins out the gate they'll take care of each other, okay? Then the other four will take care of each other later on after I harvest the first two. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You have a grass and a legume mix for the summer, and then also mm -hmm. that same legume grass mix for the fall and spring. But yep, so that's my theory, but you know how it is. We gotta test them uh, when we can. I, and the reason I said my field, um, I've, I've picked up some uh, rented ground here this past year, and I, I'm I, every time I do that, when I get a new field that I haven't taken care of for a while, I'm kind of amazed at what a lower organic matter soil, the, the lack that I see there. And uh, so I'm just putting it out there. It's, it's not to toot my own horn. It's just to tell you this stuff works. Uh, when we start building up our soil health, uh, we, can, we, we can get away from needing as many fertilizers. So if I was going into land that had been uh, either poor condition or so forth, maybe I would consider a little bit of nitrogen just to, to try to increase the biomass and get things jump started. That's how I look at it. Sure, sure. Yep. So if your soil is, is rapidly mineralizing, 
nutrients because of having a lot of biological activity, there's probably right. going to be enough available in. But if it's <laughs> poor soil or soil that's just beginning to be regenerated, you know, maybe 40 units of N would, would really help get it oh. going. Mm -hmm. um, another question here that always comes up is moisture. You know, there's parts of the country like Oklahoma and Colorado and some parts of Texas where we're getting to the point here where the spigot's going to soon turn off and who knows when the next rain is going to come. Can you address a little bit of how you view available moisture and how that affects your planting decision for a cover crop after wheat? Yeah, and there's actually some parts of the uh, world, I'll just say, that they generally get no rain over the summer months. And I was, uh, you can go back and look at my presentation on Bulgaria uh, several weeks back, where that's, that's indeed the case. They just don't get any rain. So what I advise them, and what, to answer your question, um, if there is moisture in the soil, you can plant fairly deep in dry soil to find moisture, and I say fairly deep. You can go with the sun hemp and sorghum sedan, you can, you can go two inches deep if that's where the moisture is. Uh, the only thing that would cause a problem there is you would happen to get a downpour that would, that would kind of close that up and, and be harder to grow, but that generally doesn't happen in a dry area. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is, if it indeed is dry, uh, one approach is, we'll get the seeds in the ground, you catch a rain, and they're going to start growing. So you're going to maximize an opportunity. There is one risk to that, and it's pretty big. And that would be if you would only get like one or two tenths of an inch of rain. You know, on a very dry soil where the top three or four inches is totally dry, a two-tenth inch rain will germinate the seed, but there won't be enough in the reservoir of the soil to continue for that seed to grow. So your risk would be the seed germinates and, and, then, and then dies. So that would be kind of a total loss. Uh, so that's going to have to be up to the individual farmer uh, on what to do with that. Uh, my recommendation for areas that are dry is to, uh, is, is to either take that chance if you want to or wait until it gets later on in the, in the fall and rain might be uh, starting to come back and, and you either anticipate it coming or it, you get a shower and then you're ready to plant. So that's, that's kind of how you address that in the dry areas. It is, a, it is a little bit more tricky, but I will say this. You want to be prepared if the situation presents itself. And that's why you need to learn about this and, and think about what cover crop seeds you might want. Contact your, your dealer, whoever it is, and say, I, I really think I'm going to need, I think I have the opportunity to plant cover crops this year. Do you have this seed and can you get it for me and, and make something out? So you want to be prepared if the situation presents itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I think that's everything. Uh, we'll pause one moment here if there's any other questions. Last call. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for uh, sharing those insights. And uh, definitely we'll be excited to check back with you um, later this summer as uh, these uh, trials go in at your place. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll be seeing some pictures of that sorghum sudan grass and sun hemp uh, when it's cut. In, uh, in a month or two, so we'll, we'll watch out for that.